there say amen. All right. Alicia's there. I know that. All right. All right. If you're there, look at me. All right. Okay. Ephesians 3 and verse 1 says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he'd made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge and the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. Lord, tonight as we study your word together, lead us into all truth. Open up our understanding. Holy Spirit, give us revelation and illuminate the word. Lord, renew our minds, sanctify us, God. Convict us where we need convicted. Encourage us where we need encouraged, God. Correct us where we need corrected. Do what you do through your word in us, God. Lord, I pray for your anointing that the Holy Spirit would fill this place tonight as we look at your word together. Bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight we continue in our study of this great book of Ephesians. And as we have been considering this letter of Paul, my prayer for us is that we would truly come to an understanding of what is ours in Christ. And we would see this. I was talking to another minister just, just this past week and they were telling me some of the struggles they were going through about feeling condemnation, about feeling some things that we know are not from the Lord. The Father doesn't deal with us in those means, right? If we're His children, He doesn't, he doesn't heap condemnation. He deals with us, He convicts us, He corrects us, but that's the accuser of the brethren, right? And so I told Him, I gave Him an encouragement, and I said, what? just go to Ephesians 1 and park there. Just go to Ephesians 1 and just park there and read that chapter and then go to Romans 8 and just read that chapter and park there amen let it let it fill your mind let it saturate you and here we see it's my it's my prayer that as we've been going through this book of Ephesians that we would move from infancy in our understanding and we would grow in maturity of what is ours in Christ You've, we've already looked at this. In, in Ephesians 1, we read in verse 4 that we're chosen. We read in verse 5 that we're predestined. We read in verse 5 that we are adopted as sons. We read that in verse 6 that we are accepted in the beloved. We read in verse 7 that He has redeemed us and forgiven us through the blood of Christ according to the riches of His grace. We read that we not only are forgiven and redeemed, but in Him we have an eternal inheritance. We have an, e in, an eternal inheritance. It says in verse 13 and 14 that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That we are sealed into the day of redemption. We read in chapter 2 that we were dead in sins, that we were enslaved to the world, that we were separated from God, we were enemies in our minds. All of these things... But now, but, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even while we were dead in sins, has made us alive together with Christ. We've been raised with Christ. Not only that, but we have received this, and we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Last week and the week before, we have been considering chapter 2, and how at one time we were strangers and aliens from the covenants of promise. That at one time we were without hope and without God, without Christ and without hope in the world. But now in Christ Jesus it says, You who were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We read that Jesus, it says, has broken down the middle wall of separation and has made us one. That, that he has broken down the middle wall of partition. 
That is, he brought us back to God. And not only did he bring us back to God, but he brought the Jews and the Gentiles together in one body. And we looked at this over the last few weeks that Christianity is not Judaism 2.0. Right? He made us one new man, which is the church, the body of Christ. Last week we looked, beginning in verse 19, it says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Here we looked at three things that Paul says that we are now. We are citizens of God. He says in verse 19, we're no longer strangers but fellow citizens. We belong to the kingdom of God. Our names are registered in heaven. You realize that tonight. Your name is on the roll of heaven. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life and you are a citizen of heaven. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20 says, For our citizenship is in heaven. That is where we belong. That is where our home is. Amen. You, I'm sure you could probably find it according to the census and the mailing address, but you'll find Jonathan Sears' name registered within the city limits of Ham or Cincinnati, right? But that's not my true home. My home, my eternal home, my name is registered in heaven. My name, it's an amazing thing to think about, that Jonathan Gregory Sears is written down in heaven right now. Think about that. Your name is written down in heaven right now in the Lamb's book of life. Amen? We're fellow citizens and members of the household of God. We're heirs and joint heirs. We aren't second class citizens within the kingdom, but we are full heirs. We are heirs and joint heirs. And then he says we are also God's temple, his building built on Christ. That Christ is the chief cornerstone and we are his dwelling place corporately and individually. We are living members of the body of Christ. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's an amazing thing to think about. That the church is God's, he says there, in whom you also, verse 22, are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. That the church corporately is the dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Now does that not elevate the church? That we're not, we're not a country club, right? Amen? That we are the building and the temple of God. Corporately. To me, when we understand that, that sanctifies every meeting that we have together. That makes it a significant thing. Amen? Right? That if we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, if we are the dwelling place of God by the Spirit, that means that what we do is important in this building. Right? Not only that, but we are individual members who are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. As we move forward, we see Paul. He begins to speak. Starting in verse 3, he makes mention about a mystery. A mystery that was previously hidden that has now been revealed. A mystery that at one time was not fully understood, but now has been revealed. The Bible has a lot to say in the New Testament about mystery. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 13, when he tells the parable of the four soils, and the disciples come to him and they ask him to explain it. He says in Matthew 13 and verse 11, To you it has been made known the mystery of the kingdom of God. 
You have the mystery of the kingdom. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 51, the apostle Paul says, Behold, I speak to you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. You have there the mystery of the rapture or the taking away or the catching away. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 32 when he talks about marriage and the husband and the wife and how Christ purchased his church with his own blood to present to himself a, a bride without spot or without blemish. And he says this is a mystery, the mystery of Christ and his church. In 1 Timothy 3 and verse 16 we read, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. We read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7 about the Antichrist and the mystery of lawlessness. We read in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 5 about the great harlot that's riding on the beast and it says that her name is Mystery Babylon. Mystery Babylon. Paul was, Paul uses this word frequently in chapter 3 and he's speaking of things that were once hidden but have now been revealed and that have been opened up by the Holy Spirit. And we're going to look tonight about the mystery of the church, the mystery of the body of Christ, the mystery of the union of the Jews and the Gentiles together. Let's look at this together, verse 1. He says, for this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles. And here we see Paul, the preacher and the prisoner of the mystery. He says, for this reason, that's speaking of everything that he's just said, Paul is referring to what he previously stated, and he begins a prayer in verse 1. And if you look at this, you read this chapter, he breaks off of this thought and he picks it back up in verse 14. He breaks off, he says, for this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you. And then he goes into another thought and then he picks it back up in verse 14 and goes on with his prayer. And he reveals to us all the way down to verse 13 this mystery of the church. And he, he says, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles. Now this is the reality for Paul because at the time of the writing of this book he is in a prison cell in Rome. And he makes this statement. He doesn't say I'm the prisoner of the Romans. He doesn't say I'm the prisoner of the Jews that delivered me up in Jerusalem. He says I am the prisoner of Christ. He understood that he was in prison and it was the purpose of Jesus Christ that he be sitting right where he is at. He says, I am the prisoner of Christ for you Gentiles. You realize that Paul was suffering and sitting in a prison cell because he was bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. And we talked about this a few weeks ago. A Gentile is anybody outside of Jewish descent. Anybody outside of the covenant that God had made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, anybody outside of ethnic Israel is considered a Gentile. That's us. You see, Paul suffered immensely because he preached the gospel to Gentiles. The majority of Paul's persecution, even in pagan Rome, was not at the hands of other Gentiles, but it was at the hands of his own countrymen, his fellow Jews. We see this in the book of Acts. We have to go back to the book of Acts to understand why he is in prison right now. We see in Acts chapter 21, the apostle Paul on his third missionary journey has traveled and he has taken up a collection for the poor brethren in Jerusalem. 
and he is making his way back to Jerusalem. And we read that he comes back at a, at a feast time, a celebration, a holiday of the Jews. And he delivers up to the church at Jerusalem the offering that he had taken up because of their poverty. And while he is there, turn with me to Acts chapter 21. We read that he is celebrating a feast among the Jews. It says in verse 26, Acts 21 verse 26, Then Paul took the men and the next day, having been purified with them, he entered the temple to announce the expiration of the days of purification. At which time he made an offering should be made for each one of them. Now when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him. Crying out, verse 21, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, and this place. And furthermore, he has also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. Now that was not true. He had not brought a Greek or a Gentile into the temple. Verse 29, it says, For they had previously seen Tropimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city was disturbed, and the people ran together, seized Paul, and dragged him out of the temple. And immediately the doors were shut. Now as they were seeking to kill him, that this is the persecution that he was going through. They were seeking to kill him. News came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Getting beat up by a mob. Then the commander came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains. And he asked who he was and what he had done. And some among the multitude cried one thing and some another. So when they could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult, he commanded him to be taken into the barracks. And when he reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. For the multitude of the people followed after, crying out, Away with him! Away with him. We read that Paul is taken into custody by the Romans. And as he is being led away, he says, please let me address them. Let me speak to the crowd. And they permitted Paul. So Paul begins to speak to the crowd that was just beating him up. He addresses them, he tells them about his conversion, he tells them about his Damascus Road experience, he, he tells them about seeing the Lord Jesus and how God had saved him. He says in chapter 22, verse 17, look at this with me. It says, Now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I was in a trance. This is Paul speaking. And saw him saying to me, make haste and get out, out of Jerusalem quickly, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I am in prison and beat those who believe on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I was also standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then he said to me, this is what Jesus said to Paul. This is what Jesus said to Paul. Depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. Christ called him to go to the Gentiles. Now here's what we read, the response of the crowd when they heard that. 
Verse 22 it says, And they listened to him until this word, and then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. When the Jews heard that Paul was sent to the Gentiles, they did not want to hear it. Right? Such was the division between Jew and Gentile that they could not believe it and said that he should be killed. When they heard him say he was sent to the Gentiles by Christ, they lost it. And then we read that they plot to kill him. So he's taken into custody. And then those people make a vow to one another. Fifty men make a vow that they're not going to eat or drink until they kill Paul. And Paul's nephew hears about it and goes and tells Paul while he's in prison. And Paul tells the Roman commander and at night they sneak Paul out. In the middle of the night they put him on a horse. And they have a hundred guards around him and they carry him away to Caesarea. And then while he is at Caesarea, he's there for two years, by the way, imprisoned in Caesarea. Finally, when he realizes he's not going to get a fair trial, because he is a Roman citizen, he appeals to Caesar. And that was a right of anybody that was a Roman citizen. You could appeal directly to Caesar. And the governor says, to Caesar you appealed and to Caesar you shall go. And Paul makes his way through, in the book of Acts, you read this, he makes his way to Rome and he's sitting in a prison cell. And now he's writing to the church at Ephesus. He's the prisoner of Christ for the Gentiles. He's doing this for the Gentiles. Amen. And you see in verse 2 of Ephesians, he says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you. Here he says, If you have heard, knowing that they have, of the dispensation of the grace of God. And this word dispensation is speaking of a stewardship or an administration that, that this had been entrusted to the Apostle Paul. That he had been entrusted with this message of the grace of God. He had been entrusted to proclaim and to reveal to them the grace of God. He was a steward, a, an administrator. That is, to be a steward of something means you take care of something that does not belong to you. You are entrusted with something to take care of something and to watch over something that does not belong to you. He is a steward of the grace of God. The steward supervised the buying and the selling and the records and the business of what was entrusted into his keeping. And Paul was entrusted with the gospel to the Gentiles. It was entrusted to the apostle Paul to carry this out, to be the steward of this message to the Gentiles. Let me understand tonight, you also have been given a stewardship. You also have been entrusted with gifts and callings that have been given to you by God. And that God expects you to be faithful over what he has made you a steward over, right? Amen. He expects you to be faithful over the talents that have been given over to you, right? Amen. That God has given every single one of us a purpose and a calling within his body. And we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for the things that we have done in the body. Amen? I will stand there alone and I will give an account on whether or not I was faithful over what he entrusted to me. You will stand there alone and you will give an account 
Amen? Amen. Everybody within the church has a purpose. Everybody sitting in this pew, in, the, in these chairs, has a calling. Amen? Every one of you have been given gifts. You've been entrusted with something. And what does God expect of you? Faithfulness. Faithfulness. Over what has been entrusted to you. Amen? Well done, good and talented servant. Well done, good and influential servant. Well done, good and popular servant. No. Well done, good and faithful servant. And Paul was a steward. He was given the dispensation of the grace of God, the stewardship to proclaim this message. He was entrusted with it. And I'm so, thank I'm so thankful for the Apostle Paul. I am so thankful that he was faithful. Thirteen of the 27 books of the New Testament, 14 if you count Hebrews, which me and Brother Thompson do, 14, 14 of the books of the New Testament written by Paul. I am thankful that Paul was a faithful steward. I'm thankful that Paul was faithful over the administration of the grace of God. That was given, it says there, for you... Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. We see what Paul says about this. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, he says in verse 12, 1 Timothy 1 and verse 12, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me, because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. He counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did, did it ignorantly. Turn with me to Romans 15. In Romans 15, he says in verse 15, Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. He's a minister to the Gentiles that the offering of the Gentiles might be accepted. This grace was given to him. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians 2. He says in verse 7. He says, but on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter... For he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. We see in Colossians, turn to Colossians chapter 1, 
He says in verse 24, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. Look at what verse 25 says, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me to you to fulfill the word of God. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints, whom God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We see this stewardship, this dispensation over the grace of God that he had given to the Apostle Paul to be a minister to the Gentiles. And then he says in verse 3, How that by revelation he'd made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. We see it was made known to him by revelation. You understand tonight that the mystery... This unveiling of the grace of God, of the gospel, of God's grace, came to Paul not by human agency, but by direct revelation of Jesus Christ. We see this stated in detail, where Paul speaks about the gospel that he preached was not of man, for I neither received it of man. Let's look at this in Galatians 1. In Galatians 1, he says this beginning in verse 11. He says in Galatians 1 and verse 11, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But it, when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles... I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Paul was revealed the gospel by Christ. You realize that it came by direct revelation from Jesus. And he says here that he went to Arabia. He didn't go up to the apostles, but he went into Arabia. And I love what one minister said about this. One minister said that Paul went to Arabia with Genesis and Exodus and Isaiah and Psalms in his luggage bag. He went into Arabia, but when he came out of Arabia, he came out with Romans and Ephesians and Thessalonians in his heart. He went into Arabia with this Old Testament and he came out with this revelation, this unveiling of the grace of God. You see in verse 3, he says, How that by revelation I've made known, had been, he had made known to me the mystery as I have briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. He says, I've briefly written about this already. It's speaking of chapter 1 and chapter 2 where he goes into detail of the grace of God. He goes into detail. And then we come to chapter or verse 5 and verse 6. And here we see the mystery revealed. Here we see what he's talking about. Verse 5. Which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has been now revealed by the Spirit to his apostles and his prophets. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. Verse 5 he says, In other ages it was not made known as it has now been revealed by the Spirit. Now you realize we have Old Testament prophecy, right? We have Genesis 12 and verse 
3 where God makes a covenant with Abraham. And he says, in you and in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. All those nations include the Gentiles. That, that promise includes the Gentiles. But how this would be brought about, nobody knew. Nobody knew, right? Paul makes mention of this very verse in Galatians chapter 3, how it is fulfilled in Christ. Isaiah 49 and verse 16, it speaks about Christ being the light to the Gentiles. I will give light to the Gentiles. We, we understood that there was something with the Gentiles in the Old Testament. But how that would be carried out, nobody knew. Right? It was, it was hidden. You see these verses. But nobody knew how it would take place. It had... It was a mystery, but now it has been revealed by the Holy Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. It, is, it was made known. It was unveiled to them by the Spirit of God that holy men of God preached the gospel and then penned it. They wrote it down. This revelation that was given to them wrote to us what we have now as the New Testament canon, Peter, John... Paul, James, and Jude. This is, this is God's word. It was revealed to them by the Holy Spirit. Jesus told them this would take place. Turn with me to John chapter 16. In John 16... Jesus said in verse 13, John 16 and verse 13, However, when, the, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. For He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will tell you things to come. He will glorify Me, for He will take of what is Mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter makes this statement about the prophets that went before. He says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10. It says of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves but to us they were ministering the things which have now been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into." now been revealed. The mystery has now been revealed. There's an old saying that is so important. The new is in the old concealed. The new is in the old concealed. The old is in the new revealed. Amen? We don't understand the book of Hebrews without Leviticus. You can't. You can't understand Hebrews. You can't understand the book of Romans without Exodus. You can't. The new is in the old concealed. The old is in the new revealed. This mystery that was hidden has now been revealed by the Spirit to His holy apostles and prophets. Verse 6, here's the mystery. Here's what it is. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of His promise in Christ through the gospel. Here's the mystery. The Gentiles are fellow heirs. They belong to the same body. 
the partakers of the promise in Christ through the gospel. He says here three things about it. Number one, we're fellow heirs. We're fellow heirs. Once we were excluded, right? Once we were aliens from the co commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise. But now we're fellow heirs. Amen? Not only that, but turn with me to the book of Galatians. Chapter 3. And I want you to realize that this is why Paul is suffering. The book of Galatians, he says in the last chapter, if I proclaim that men should be circumcised, then I would suffer, or then I wouldn't suffer. If, if I went into the Gentiles and basically said, hey, Jesus did this, but you still need to become a Jew... That, that's literally what the Judaizers were doing. They were coming behind the Apostle Paul to the region of Galatia. They entered into these churches. Paul said stealthily. They snuck in. They observed their liberty and they said, Whoa, whoa, hey guys, if you really want to be holy, if you really want to be accepted by God, we know that Christ has saved you, you've received the Holy Spirit by faith and all of those things, but if you really, really want to get serious, you better become circumcised and keep the law of Moses just like us. And Paul would have none of it. He would not for one minute compromise. Because, because if you add anything to the gospel, you lose the gospel. If you add anything to the gospel, it's no longer the gospel. Amen? It's just another works-based religion. Which cannot save you. And either will make it miserable or a Pharisee. Amen? But he makes this statement in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. He says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. Father Abraham had many sons, right? Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them. And so are you. Amen. Amen. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. You're a part of the promise. And heirs, look at what it says there, and heirs according to the promise. I am Abraham's seed. I'm a child of Abraham. How? By faith. Right? When was the promise given to Abraham? It was before he was circumcised, right? It was before. And it was his faith was counted to him as righteousness. We are fellow heirs. And then he says, we are of the same body. We are full members. We are not secondary or lesser, but we are... One, we are a part of the body of Christ. We all are. Whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter your ethnic background, your ed where you came from. We are all part of one body. Members of the body. Paul makes this clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's turn there. Got a lot of Bible reading tonight, didn't we? Amen? You know what one minister said? I put a lot of Bible in my messages. So even if I fall flat in my message, you still got the Bible. 
it, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. It said, For as the body is one, and as many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. Look at this. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. We are one body. Jew, Greek, Jew, Gentile, doesn't... This was the mystery that has now been revealed, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, that the Gentiles should be members of the body, of the same body, and then partakers of His promise in Christ through the gospel. We are partakers of His promise. In Christ through the gospel. We receive and partake of this promise. The same way anybody else will. It's through the gospel. How is anybody saved today? There's only one way. Doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile. There's only one way. There's not a way for another ethnic group. And a way for this ethnic group. There's only one way. One way. It's Christ. Through the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sin. That he made him who knew no sin to be sin for me. That I might become the righteousness of God in him. Isaiah 53, surely he has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Christ on the cross took our punishment. He took our sin. He bore our separation. You realize that? He bore our separation. Right? He cried out, quoting Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He bore the separation for us. So we would never have to be separated from God. Amen? He died in our place as the sin offering. And then three days later, in fulfillment of the Old Testament, as a declaration to the world that he is exactly who he said he is, that God is faithful to his promise, he rose from the dead. Right? To display to us that God had accepted his sacrifice. Because if God had not accepted his sacrifice, what would have happened with Jesus? He would still be dead. Right? But he was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. And now everybody that calls on his name with the same faith of Abraham, believing him, anybody that believes puts their trust in Jesus, is saved, will receive salvation and new birth. They will enter into that new covenant and be given a new heart and a new nature. That's the gospel. There's only one way to be saved. Amen? And Paul would say in the book of Corinthians that the message of the cross, the preaching of the cross, is foolishness to the Greeks... Right? They want to hear something wise. They want to hear some philosophy. They want to hear Aristotle and Socrates. They, they want some, all these wisdom that, that was handed down through the Greeks. The Jews, the message or the preaching of the cross, is a stumbling block. Because they think they're already righteous. They think they can earn their righteousness. So when the gospel's presented to them, they trip over it. Because they're trying to earn their own way. But he says to us who receive it, it is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. There's only one way to be saved and it's through Christ. Amen. He says there at the end that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. Amen. Amen. Let's pray tonight.
We see it's all, all in Christ. We are reconciled. We are brought into one body. We are fellow heirs, partakers of the promises through the gospel, through Christ. Lord, we love you tonight. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the gospel, for the good news of our salvation. Thank you, Lord, for what you have accomplished. That it, it, it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but it's according to your mercy that you saved us. Thank you, Lord, that we are saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Thank you, Lord, that we have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That we're no longer strangers, we're no longer foreigners. But we are partakers of the same promises. We are heirs, fellow heirs, and members of the household of God. We praise you, Lord. We thank you, God. And Lord, I pray tonight that we would grow, grow in this grace, grow in this understanding. And as we grow, our love for you and our worship would overflow in our hearts and our lives. God, we praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.